And I want to start a bit more broadly and come back to the point why we are interested in understanding something about marine microbes. And the reason, at least for us, is actually fairly simple, because if you take a drop of seawater and put it under the microscope, you will find an enormous number of microbial cells. And estimates state that the number of cells we have on Earth even exceeds the number of stars we have in the universe. So I guess it's very easy to imagine how important these microbes are, for example, looking at global carbon cycles or other nutrient cycles. If you want to understand something about the individual role of microbes, there are several means we can take. The most traditional one is that we take our sample, put it on a plate, and we work with what grows. And this is extremely powerful. However, there's one major caveat, and that is that only a very small fraction, depending on the environment we are working with, can be cultivated at the moment. So what we know is only based on a very small fraction of the total community, which can be problematic in our understanding. However, we have benefited in the last, I think by now 10, 15 years from sequencing technologies that allow us to look at these microbes without having to cultivate them, but we can use the DNA or the RNA or proteins as an intermediate. And we as a group, as a team, mainly work with what is called a metagenome assembled genome, a so-called MAC. And here in a very simplified manner, um, quickly want to introduce how our data looks like. So what we are doing is um, we have a sample of interest, we extract the DNA, and ideally that DNA contains the genomes from all individual community members. And this we then sequence mostly with Illumina's technologies, so generating a high amount of very short reads, typically 125 base pairs. So that in itself doesn't tell you a lot. So the next thing we have to do is we have to assemble these reads into much larger context, and we can then use the sequence information, the coverage information to bin genomes out of the complex community data, and these can be up to 90%, sometimes even 100% complete. And once we have these genomes, we can ask a lot of things. So we, for example, can ask where in the tree of life does our genome place? And also we can look at metabolic genes and ask what do these organisms potentially eat? So there's a lot we can do without having to grow anything. And this really has changed how we are viewing the tree of life as shown here in a tree you might have all seen plenty of times before. And you see here on top the bacterial diversity and on the bottom, the archaeal diversity. And everything that is highlighted with a red dot is basically a lineage we cannot grow in the lab. And that's still mostly true today. But at least now we have a genome or a MAC, so we can ask what might be a potential reason why we cannot grow this organism. And among this diversity, we are especially interested in one group of archaea, the so-called deep archaea. And we are interested in them for several reasons. For once, they're extremely diverse and by some believe to be deep branching. So what you see in this tree here, the deep archaea cluster sister to all other archaea. And the idea we have is that understanding something about them might tell us something about how archaea evolved. But also they have other interesting features. So for once, they have some of the smallest size cells and very small genomes. So in the case of the best studied example, Nanarchium ectitans, this organism has just 500 genes. So that's not a lot. It has a very limited metabolic potential and among others cannot even make its own membrane lipids. So it actually gets its lipids from its host, Ignococcus and other archaeum, to be able to grow and proliferate. And since most deep archaea have such a small genome, we believe a similar thing is true for most of them, that they do rely on other organisms for growth. So the first thing we did was first get a better grasp on how diverse are they really. And so for this, we take a database-based approach where we took as many genomes as we could from public databases. And really the details here are not important, but basically every single color in this phylogenetic tree highlights a different phylum in the deep archaea. And we now know that, that there are at least 10 different phyla, highlighting that despite their small genomes, that they are extremely diverse and they are found all over the place. So they are not only found in the marine water column, they are also in sediment, in soil, and some have even been found in the human lung. 
But in all of those cases, we have no idea what the ecological role is. And among this diversity, we at the moment are particularly interested in one lineage that is deep branching and potentially branching sister to all other deep anarchia, the so-called uninacute. And so we are interested in them because understanding some, something about a deep branching lineage might tell us something about how deep an archaea evolved. So let's say Undina Kyoto have very small complete genomes. This could indicate that deep an archaea lost genes over time and just evolved into this host dependency. And that's something that we want to look at. But to really be able to do this, the first thing we really have to make sure that this tree is correct. Because if the position isn't correct, we cannot say a lot. And so we really started at the beginning and that was finding a good marker set for your phylogenetic analysis. And so first you ideally want to have more than one marker protein because what you're doing is you are aligning your sequence information. And then basically you paste together all the sequences into one long string because the idea is the more sequence information you have, the better the signal. Now, if you do this, these proteins all follow sim have to follow similar rules. So they have to be universally distributed in all the organisms you care about. And also they should ideally be only found in single copy. Also, what is important if you care about archaea and bacteria, archaea should be monophyletic. So we want something like this. And I know it's very small, the details don't matter at all. What matters are the colors. So in the color code, the four colors depict the four major lineages in the archaea. And on the bottom here, you have the bacteria. So we can see archaea and bacteria cluster apart. So archaea are monophyletic. And that's what we want for our trees. What we don't want is something like this. You can see here that bacteria are intermingled all within the archaea. So they are not monophyletic. So this is not a phylogenetic signal. Well, it's, it's still a phylogenetic signal, but it's affected by a lot of horizontal gene transfers. That's nothing we want. Also, what we don't want is a lot of transfers within the archaea. And so to limit the amounts of transfers we have, and every marker protein will have a certain amount of transfers, we developed a ranking scheme to select the top 25%, top 50% of marker proteins to really have reliable trees. And so to give you an example of what we are looking for, that's something we want. We want that the major phyla classes that are defined in the archaea are clustering together. So here, for example, we see that all genomes of the thormacuta, which are major ammonia oxidizers in the ocean, cluster together. That's what we would expect. That's a phylogenetic signal we want. What we don't want is something like this. The colors are all intermingled. And if we look more closely, we can see that the thormacute are actually found into four different positions. So we have a lot of what we call splits. So this second tree would be ranked way worse because we have too many transfers going on. And ideally, we only want to include those markers with the least amount of these signals. And now, of course, you can ask me, does it really matter? People are using certain marker sets since ages to kind of prove this point we decided to combine the 25% of the worst markers to really see if it matters. And that's basically what we get. So roughly saying you see the colors kind of look okay, but there are some issues in there. So for example, you can see that non-archaea, which are deep archaea, cluster right within the cranarchaea, which is a completely other phylum. So they are not really related. But what we see here is actually a signal that likely can be explained by two reasons. For once, nanoracuta and cranacuta are adapted to high temperatures, which also um, is reflected in protein evolution. Second, we know that host and symbionts can interchange genes. Um, so very likely this effect is due to these um, two factors and has nothing to do with its real placement in the tree of life. So it does matter. But does it not matter for the uninacuta, which as you may hopefully remember, um, we first believe to be branching sister to all other archaea. Now, if you look at this updated marker set consisting of 28 or 56 proteins, we see something like this. And here we actually see that 
or Nina Kyoto are not at the base anymore, but they actually seem to split deep and Aki apart into two very different clusters, which for now we just name cluster one and cluster two. And depending a bit on where the root is, and I'm not going to talk too much about that, um, we do have a slight idea that deep and Akia actually might be two separate groups, which would be quite interesting in itself. But to kind of confirm this placement, we took an, another approach and asked, do we see differences in the gene content that confirm this pattern? And this is something you see here. So what you see at the right-hand side are all the major lineages in the Akia with the deep on Akia at the bottom. And then here we have the genes for the electron transport chain with the nine genes um, at the right-hand side that make up the ATP synthase. And the blue are the color, the more genomes in a cluster have that gene. So as you would expect, most Akia have the ATP synthase, but already here, cluster two deep on Akia are very different as a lot of them, including Nano Akiota, don't have an ATP synthase. So they very likely are energy parasites. And so we asked, do we see other patterns? So we looked at a lot of genes, um, looking for example at carbon metabolism, amino acid biosynthesis, motility, and asked, what are the general features we see for deep anarchia? And as you would expect, which is linked to the small genomes, they lack a lot of genes. So for example, most of them are not able to make their own amino, amino acids they cannot make their own lipids, and they also have very, very few transporters, which indicates that they cannot take these compounds from the environment, but that they indeed rely on a host to grow. What's interesting, though, is that we also see quite some strong differences between cluster one and cluster two deep anarchia. So, for example, cluster one very likely can make its own lipids, while all the genes are more or less absent in cluster two. Similarly, cluster one is more complete if we look at amino acids or vitamin biosynthesis. And so this could mean, and I say this very carefully because again, we have the problem with the root. This could mean that the ancestor of the deep anarchia might have been more complex and deep anarchia lost genes over time. But this leads me to what we're currently doing is rooting the Akio tree and trying to find out who was the last common ancestor because we need this to direct or have a direction for evolution, so to speak. But another thing we were wondering using in this data set was, can we find means to grow deep anarchia in the lab? And so to grow deep anarchia, you need to grow them with a host. So we need to find means to predict who the host is. And as I've told you, we do know that host and symbionts often interchange genes. So we were wondering if we look at enough single gene trees, do we find a strong enough signal? So we looked at 500 genes that are commonly found in undine acuota, made single protein trees and asked, how often do we see a sign of horizontal gene transfers? And again, let's first look at nano acuota because that's the best studied example. And for nano acuota, we have many trees like this, where nano acuota for sister to some other deep anarchia, so the, let's call it phylogenetic signal, is the strongest. That's something we would expect. <clears throat> But if we look at enough trees, we hope to see something like this. Here we can see that nano acute is falling right inside the Crinachia again, and exactly sister to its host Ignococcus. So that's a very strong signal for gene transfer. And we are hoping that we find enough of these signals to be able to predict a host both for nano acute, where we know the answer, but also for undine acute. So we scored all these 500 protein trees. And so for now, we just focus on nano acuota where we have around 220 genes and ask, to what is nano acuota assisted to? And in most cases, we can see like 60% of the case that the phylogenetic signal is the strongest, but also we see around 25% of trees where nano acuota assisted to three specific cranachia, all of which are known hosts of nano acuota. So at least for nano acuota, this works quite well. And we did this for all the different lineages in the Akia, and of course, with a specific focus on the undine acuota. Again, here we can see that the phylogenetic signal is the strongest. We also have some signs of horizontal gene transfer, but it's to very, very many different lineages, and none of the percentages 
is different to what we have in the background. So to what we see in other Akia lineages. So unfortunately, at the moment, there is not a clear signal. And so there could be several explanations for that. For once, we know that Unin acute is more complete. The genome is more complete. Um, it very likely can make its own lipids. So potentially it is less strongly reliant on one specific host. Another problem, well, problem, another issue could be our data set. Since it's from public, publicly available genomes, we had to downsample a lot to be able to run these trees. We simply might not have the genome from the, from the Unina Kyoto host. And so this leads me a bit to the outlook of what we are doing right now. So we sampled the water column from the Black Sea a while, black, a while back, and um, we already assembled and bin the genomes. And so we focus on the Black Sea because we beforehand knew deep and IKEA are quite abundant. And so now we have 40 additional genomes from the Unin Acuta and hopefully also the genomes from the host. So we are currently repeating this analysis to be hopefully able to find the host, go back in the future and be able to grow these organisms in the lab. But there's not much I can show you there right now. So I hopefully for this talk, could convince you that choosing the right marker set can matter, especially if you look at deep evolution. Because for us, we were able to show that Unina Kyoto are actually not at the base of the DPAM, but depending on where the root is, might actually split deep and Akia apart into two very different phylogenetic groups that potentially might not even be related. And also we do see some consistencies um, for these clusters in the metabolic abilities where the group with the Undin Akiota and the cluster 1 Akia are more complete, which could have some interesting evolutionary implications we're currently addressing. And also looking at single proteins or trees in general can be helpful, as we do hope that it will allow us to identify the host of Undin Akiota, but also for other deeper Akia in the future. And with this, I'm at the end. There are, of course, a lot of people involved in this work, um, all the members of our team, also great collaborators who are especially helpful for the phylogenetic analysis we are doing. And of course, thanks to you for inviting us. And um, I'm curious about any questions you might have. And 